We mustn't be victims, but protagonists of our stories. Don't you think it's time things were different? As individuals, we have an impossible battle. Thanks so much for joining us, John. Uh, it's I'm still getting a little used to doing these uh, remotely. I, I'd love to be able to do these in person. What oh, yeah. has, uh, how has this adjustment been for you? Uh, and I'm sure you had a very whirlwind end of 2019 to head right into um, the pandemic with everything shut down. What, what's that experience been like for you this year? Well, it's just been a very huge transition as it's been for a lot of people who I think um, being at home and, and, and having to quarantine for so long and then making these adjustments has been so mad. Um, it's been highs, it's been lows, but, you know, I can't complain in comparison, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. But it's just about, you know, the mystery of, of what's next. And I just wonder what else could this year possibly uh, dish us. So it's, it's, it's been it's been all right, but we're just getting through it, just getting through it. I could describe what small acts is, but I'm going to punt that over to you, John, to kind of uh, give us give us a synopsis of what what these five uh, episodes of this anthology are about. Yeah, I mean, I, I see them as five films, uh, just just because of of the quality and what Steve has done with this. But essentially, it's five five films that, that goes into the experiences of, of of Black Caribbean people in the UK um, through various um, obstacles and, and and challenges in in a London that, and a, and in a Britain that's not necessarily uh, ready for their kind of representation. Um, there's love in there. There's there's an explore, exploration of, of social di divide, uh, family dynamics change. In my specific um, uh, film, right, Red, White and Blue, um, I play Leroy Logan, who is a police of, uh, scientist turned police officer who wants to go into an institution and obviously change it from the inside. Um, and that stands as one of the biggest challenges of his life. Um, and small, mac, small acts really in, in its strange, unique um, format created by Steve McQueen joins all these different stories together to give us just a, a really, really good dynamic insight into, you know, British history. And I know Steve McQueen first announced the project back in 2014, uh, but we didn't get your casting announcement until last year in 2019. At what point did you become part of the project? Did you become aware of the project? Did it become something you wanted to do? Um, it was literally as soon as they were done, I think they, they approached me, you know, being a few months out of, of, of shooting and they were ready to go. Um, and I, that's the first time I'm here and I didn't know, I have no idea that um, Steve mentioned it in 2014, but when Steve approached me, I was just done with the franchise. So I was like, this is perfect. You know, I've, just, I've been looking for something to, to do. Um, I'm at the crossroads now when it's kind of like what's next and the healthiest thing for me to do is definitely to um, be a part of something and, and partner up with somebody that I definitely creatively trust um, and so it was, an, it was definitely a no-brainer for me. Your character you said tries to enter something and change something from the inside. You yourself uh, are, have been very outspoken in terms of fighting for racial equality mm -hmm. and against injustice all over the globe. Um, mm -hmm. How much of that played into your desire to be a part of this project specifically? And do you feel like you learned as an advocate and, and voice, do you feel like you learned anything by, by doing this project? Um, I think that this, this was a story for me that I just, wa I, I wanted to see told. Like I was just, I wanted to be a part of, of, I wanted to be the artist who presented you this story. I wanted you, I wanted to play the guy that, that you, you as an audience have to understand and, and, and follow. Um, and for me, because this was done, you know, before the protests or before any of, of the stuff that's gone down, before even we went to lockdown, you know, um, it, it was a, a time for us to reflect on the conversations that were bubbling and issues that were, were still, you know, apparent. And the fact that whenever you bring out these type of films, it always seems to be timeless, you know, and, 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 and having to, to deal with, with, that, with that reality. So um, it, was, it was an interesting process with all of it. Well, the listeners a little bit more about Logan and uh, Red, White and Blue and kind of the journey that he goes on. Yeah, you know, Leroy Logan starts off as a scientist, uh, baby on the way, very full family, a father that loves him, mother that cherishes him, um, and a great um, educator, somebody that is prominent in his field and is doing quite well. And because of the changes in his community, he decides that he's of better use uh, by fighting for representation within the police force. Um, and he puts himself 
um, in that position, um, first off, as his strategy, he joins and then is obviously met with institutional racism um, and has to navigate this very, very toxic space. Um, and this film just really dwells into the challenges of that and the day-to-day -day conflicts that come with this, you know, being a black man joining the Met at the time, the Met didn't necessarily have the greatest race relations with their with their black uh, civilians. Uh, you were seen as a traitor or a Judas, and and you can see in the scenes in the, in, in the film that he's called this several different times. Um, and those conflicts are are also explored in this as well. Uh, finally, we don't see the officers as kind of like ghoulish bodies in uniforms with no identity. We go into one officer's um, strategy to try and change things and, and we try and experience um, his frustrations. One of the moments that I found uh, that really resonated was, I think, uh, particularly, and, and will, I think, for a lot of American audiences is, uh, obviously, we are living in a time that we're hyper conscious of race relations in this in, in our country and, and uh, all over the world, really, it's making people analyze, analyze that kind of stuff in a way that we haven't in a long time. Uh, but there's a moment in which a uh, character tells your character, uh, you know, this isn't like the States where they have a bunch of, of uh, black officers already. And it's, it's just interesting as an American watching this project for, for them to, to say like, hey, hey, like at least from the outside, it looks like they've got this going on a little bit better over right. there at the time. Right, right. Yeah, it was interesting to, interesting to know that that was, that was the perspective as well, especially when talking to Leroy, you know, just to see from looking from the outside in, it was like, oh, we need that representation. Um, as he says to his, his mate, it's just like, you know, if I was in the police force, do you believe I'll drape you up? Do you think I'd mess you up if I was there? Um, and, to, and to see that and to understand that Leroy found that to be um, a very, very serious issue that could possibly lead uh, to more discrimination um, for him to put himself in a line like that and to put himself in a position where he said goodbye to a prospect, a prospect that was quite healthy for him. You know, scientists, it's good, good money. Um, that's a, a very brave thing to do. It is. Uh, emotionally, you do have to go to some very dark places uh, while it, it, your character has to go to some pretty dark places during the episode. Uh, because of the color of his skin, uh, both he's like you said he's treated he's treated uh, as an outsider both in his community and at work because of his choices. Um, that can be an easy mental state to stay in as an as an actor uh, for a prolonged period of time. But something that really struck me watching it is that is how many people of color experience life uh, on a day to day basis is that fear and pressure that you get. Um, from code switching and from being, you know, maybe the only one like you in the room. Uh, talk to us a little bit about getting into that space and get also living in that space as, as just John. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you, you definitely transfer um, some experiences, some feelings from your own personal day-to-day um, -day experience into the, into the role. Um, but the intensity of, of Leroy's time the intensity of being one of the founding fathers of representation within the UK Met is is different, and 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 there's some travelling to do, as I like to call it. Um, and emotionally, it's quite it's quite draining to see that he was always navigating such a space that wasn't welcoming. You know, before we're put into positions on set, you know, most of the other police officers would be in their big groups. You know, with about five or six of them feeling like they had a um, a sense of of, of, of partnership with each other. And while the, the officers of color would be on the other side of the room just by themselves and quite isolated and not, not really supported. And to actually sit, live and breathe in those situations, you know, I don't know how Leroy done it because it, if it was me, every scene, you're seeing the AK. <laughs> every scene, but Leroy is just, controlled and, and knows that there's a strategy, knows that there's there's a goal that he's working towards and and keeps that as at the centerpiece of his decision making. Uh, as as much as we've been concentrating on the on the very uh, dark periods of the film, there are there are light moments uh, and I want to get to some of the music in a minute. Um, but one of one of them that that is definitely a wink to the audience is there. There is I don't want to spoil exactly what it is, but there is a Star Wars reference in the script. Was that in it before your was that in it before your participation or was that added as a wink afterwards? No, nah, it was always in it. It was always in it. 
And I was like, is that, like, should I have a, nah, whatever, it's cool. And then I just, <laughs> <laughs> it just stayed in, it just stayed in. But people, people, people liked it at the festivals. I was like, wow, okay, cool. Yeah, they like a little, little, little Star Wars reference over there. It's kind of cool. You referenced, uh, you know, looking for your project after filming the trilogy. Um, compare and contrast to me working on a like, you know, massive blockbuster budget action film like those, uh, and then getting to kind of do a quieter project like this one. Do, do you tackle that any differently as an actor? And what is that experience like for you? And were you looking for something that was very, very, very different uh, when you were leaving that project with the trilogy? Um, no, definitely. I've just, con I, I think for me, I was just continuing um, what, what I've always wanted to do. I mean, I remember, I think it was between episode eight and nine, I did Detroit and um, I just wanted, I just like to do it. I just like being the things I like to watch and I like to watch all types of shit. So for me, it was a, a great opportunity to just step into versatility a bit, run in the opposite direction, and offer, offer something different to the audience, you know? Um, and at the same time, be a part of a story that I felt gave me the opportunity to film from home, you know, use use my own accent ish, you know, but use an accent that I'm 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 quite um I'm quite used to, and just to feel that that sense of 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 artistry and and, and work that you get from working with Steve McQueen. This is a, a very timely piece, but it is a period piece, mm -hmm. and uh, your character loves Motown music, and we get some great moments of him uh, enjoying music in the car and dancing and that kind of stuff. Uh, were you are you, were you a fan of music of that era? Uh, and if not, did you discover any any music that you now have taken on to to your uh, daily life? Yeah, Mo Motown definitely. I've actually I've actually been to to to, to Motown and, and and been to the actual studios. They used to they used to record while I was um, doing some press for Detroit in Detroit. And 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 for me, I've always been a fan of, of that type of music. But to me, the 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 surprising one was the UK jazz funk. I was like, wait, I didn't even know that was going down. Um, I think in the in the scene where he's having a dance with with Lenny, he has to he's in leather pants, and we had to learn a, a few of a few of those dance moves. Um, let's just say it was a very liberating experience. <laughs> uh, because you are a, a, an advocate, and and you know, I, you know, you were active in the protests, and and really have been using your voice to to make sure that progress is being made. How, how freeing is it to have a project that allows you to do that both in your art uh, as well as in your promotion, you know, getting to talk about those subject matters now? Yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's mad, you know, to, to have that. Obviously now, if you, if you do any kind of socially conscious project, people feel like, you know, maybe you met a director at the protest and that's why you got it. But what's great is that to know, obviously that Red, White and Blue filmed prior um, and to know that that's always been a, a passion of mine, um, but to see it reflect in reality, it is cool. It is cool. Um, I guess it's also weird. It's also quite, it's also very, it's also very, very strange. Um, it's very strange. It's very strange to do that because now you probably are looking at scenes and we could look at scenes in, in scripts that we're looking at and being like, well, that kind of looks like, you know, it's too close to what's happening in reality. And it's like, cannot believe now that reality is that dramatic, you know? So it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, um, interesting sync, I say. It certainly shows us how far we've come, but also how little uh, yeah. change actually happened. Right, right. There's, uh, I think you, Gail, you all do a fantastic job of portraying the culture of your character's family and uh, really giving a voice to their experience. What was it like to get to work on this project with, uh, you, because there are often projects in which uh, I'm sure you show up and you are one of the only few people of color, uh, both in front of and behind the camera. And in this oh, yeah. project, that was not the case. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was great to, to know that and to network. Several people uh, who know other individuals that I've worked with also in the industry and we were, we were, we were, it was great to really just connect. But obviously what was important to me also was the conversation that it sparked up. I met um, a, a, a guy who, I've got, um, I think he was Grip, um, and he let me know about his, uh, his, 
experiences being in the Met in the 70s and how he he worked at a, a station in London um, and because of, of, of their um, innate racism and because he was kind of like titled as the, the local little snitch, you know, who, who just didn't like what they were doing, um, he, he left and, and he was telling me how it, it, it was important being on set, seeing this kind of story um, conveyed. And I was there on set, it was actually when we done the, the, the reshoots in Wolverhampton. And I was just there shots like, mate, that's that's so crazy. And he goes, yeah, and now I'm working on this. Like, I'm seeing how the Bobby's dressed. Like, I'm, it's, it's bringing him um, memories, but also there's a pain there of his experience of then, you know, having to leave that environment, an environment that he actually wanted to be a part of. That's really powerful. And I'm so glad he got that experience and that you got to know the impact that this yeah. project is going to have on people. Speaking yeah. of that, what do you hope uh, people take away from Red, White, and Blue? I think it's just, it's, it's, it's such an education. I think, it, uh, as I said before, it's a perspective that we, we, haven't, we don't have a lot of content on this. Um, and it's just an exp the, the expression of creativity coming from Steve McQueen is, is very special. You know, these were scenes that we fought hard to convey truth in these scenes. And, and, and if there wasn't any truth conveyed in it, we weren't going to, we weren't going to shoot it, you know, we, we had to get it before each each and every given day. So I feel like the passion that reads off this project will definitely, you know, help guide people in the conversations that they need to have, the research that they need to do to see that these issues are still continuous, but to then be inspired by individuals like Leroy Logan, um, who has a definitely a positive strategy in terms of just maneuvering and navigating such a negative space. As a collective, we stand a chance. If you are the big tree, we are the small axe, sharpened to cut you down.